in there you can see that just there there's the exit price just in there and that was a nice sell because if, assuming you were able to hold on to it because it did retest it would have stopped you out at break even but assuming you came back in again at 74 you traded 60 so 14 points i mean it's 280 dollars it's not uh, earth shattering stuff but it comes back to that conversation we had with you guys before can we find a way of not losing money i don't care about making money can we find a way of losing money? That's pretty much the essence of this whole classroom, isn't it, when you think about it? Everything we do is about statistical arbitrage, isn't it? It's about trying to find trades that might not go on to make fortunes, but simply don't lose money. And if they do, they lose very small amounts. And if they do lose, they lose very irregularly based on values, based on relative value, based on the conversation that we're having with the relative value ideas. And because of that, we're hitting 90 plus percent winners. And when we do win, we don't always win big. We sometimes win small, we sometimes win small, we sometimes win small, but sometimes, because we are playing often enough, we occasionally get those big lifting trades, don't we? A great example, actually, was a trade that I was doing live with the guys in the room this morning, and it was on oil. And um, these were all the trades. This was one trade, guys. I sold it, we got to stop at break even. I sold it again, we got to stop at break even. We made money on every single one of these trades. You know, when we sold it, we always sell, you know, more than two contracts and we take out at least one of the contracts on the way down and then we put a stop at break even on the remainder. The remaining position is two contracts. So we sell it, make money, scratch. Sold it again on the way down, made money, scratch. Sold it again, made money, scratch. Sold it again, made money, scratch. Sold it again, made money. We just kept making money. We just kept making money. It didn't go anywhere. It actually went up. Believe it or not, guys, the oil price at that stage actually went up, and I'd sold it six times, and I made money. In fact, I think I sold it seven times. I just forgot to take one screenshot because it was too quick. Um, we took seven trades, and we won on all seven trades. And the price went higher, not lower, higher. Is that not the essence of trading? To get the big picture wrong and still walk away with a thousand dollars in profit. Crazy, right? To get the big picture wrong and still walk away with a grand has got to be the holy grail of trading, right? It's got to be the holy grail of trading. <clears throat> anyway, we never got these two sales right, but we made money. We got we never got this sale right. We made money. We got this sale right. Now we're taking profits, right? Now we're taking profits on this sale. Do you see that profit take coming in on the down tick here? So we're taking profits on the down tick here, yeah. So that profit takes at eighty eight four, okay, thirty five, thirty five points, guys. Thirty five points taking profits. 700 bucks eventually in that sale, guys, $700. Does it matter that we didn't make much money on this sale or this sale? Did it matter? Did it matter we didn't make huge profits on these two sales now that we've just made 700 bucks on a target price here? Of course not. Doesn't make any difference. Now, you saw that trade live. If you were watching live, you saw it live because it was on the screens at the time of that sell trade coming in, you might well have seen it for yourself. <clears throat> you probably wouldn't have been surprised about it. Why? Well, if you think about it from a structural point of view, you'd already seen a sell trade here into a low price here, and you'd have been thinking to yourself, well, that was a failed auction there, correct? That was a failed auction. So realistically, you're going to be saying to yourself, what? Based on that failed auction, I'm going to work some sell orders up at this price area here, yeah? And then Max comes back in again and whacks it. Yeah? So Max comes back in there at 74s, whacks it short. And obviously it's just dropped beautifully now down to 32s from 72s. That's four, 40 ticks, 40 points, 40 points, $800 now on that sale trade, guys. 
Another profit take opportunity. See it? Another profit take. Absolute perfection, isn't it? And does that profit take line up with the teachings? The teachings. Well, if that's the swing low, and the teachings suggest that we should take profits at a measure, if that's the swing low there, and the, the teachings suggest we should start taking profits at measures, does that line up with the teachings? What do you think? There's the high price, there's the swing low, and there's your measure move box there. Almost exactly in line with what we've kind of been talking about, isn't it? Makes a bit of sense? No. All right, fair enough. Um, okay, what's been happening on oil? Let's uh, move on to oil for a second and let's see what we can see. I see, um, is it Mark that's been doing uh, scalping on oil? I hope one of the things that you're using, Mark, on your scalp is to try and understand the idea of a good scalp and a poorer scalp. A good scalp and a poorer scalp. Now, why is that important? Because obviously some trades, like for example, we got a brilliant scalp sale up here, didn't we? Look at that scalp sale. Why is that a brilliant scalp sale? This was the area that we, by the way, this is the area that I've just showed you on the uh, on the uh, the screenshot of the trades. This area here, that's what I was selling. Oh, yes, you might laugh your heads off now, guys, but I was selling that and I still made a thousand, so laugh all you like. I still made a thousand dollars per contract through that horrid phase. But that's what happened, of course. We went higher. Now, why did we go higher? Well. Because the dollar's been offered today. The dollar's got this offer in it. If I take away the, uh, the spreads at the moment, the dollar's had this background offer, which I told everybody about this morning. And I said, look, this is, this is bullish oil. It doesn't matter about necessarily the short-term individual swings, because you've got the macro swing that you've got to still always pay attention to as well. And the idea is, well, we've got to be careful about selling this. We really do have to be careful. That's why I'm selling, and I'm selling very, very, very pristinely. I'm demanding the best possible price. I'm not crossing spreads once there, did I? I didn't cross the spreads once. That's why I was able to make $1,000, Paul, because I never crossed the spread once. But when it started to come out, look, the dollar started to give us a strong bid, okay? <clears throat> look at the difference. The dollar's giving us a strong bid from not a top edge, from a lower top, right? So the bid is coming in in the dollar here from that direction there. So it's not just like a top edge reversal type trade as this was. This is sell, this sell in the purple line is coming from the lower ledges. That's sellers at lower prices. That's better for me, right? We'll cover, kind of cover this in classroom this afternoon because this, this is one of those key ideas that we asked if everybody understood it, but we we're still getting stickiness about it in terms of understandings. Um, the idea is, of course, that people you know, have to have an ability to draw in a concept of fair value. So when we're getting sellers at lower prices, that's dropping the fair value. Because if I'm getting sellers at highs and buyers at lows and sellers at highs and buyers at lows, where is fair value going to, guys? Where's fair value going to if, if, if I'm getting sellers at highs and buyers at lows consistently? Where's fair value? It's right in the middle, right? It's right bang in the middle. It hasn't moved anywhere. But the seller on the dollar came in from the low here, didn't it? You see the difference, Everett? The seller came in from the low price here, not the top line. From the low price here, that seller came in. So that really does move value for me. Does that make sense to everybody? I've got to move value, guys. I have to move value because in a relative value scale, that's all I can base my assessment against, right? So, for example, if I'm telling you that the market's... Okay, I'm drawing a squiggly line. Let's do a straight one. If I'm telling you from a market perspective, the markets are doing something like this, okay? So we come up to this point here and we get this. Is this value bullish or bearish? Well, some people will say, well, I don't know. It's, you know, and if the price was, for example, doing this, Is 
Is this bullish or bearish? It's still bullish, isn't it, when you think about it? But yet a lot of people see this as bearish. Now, it eventually will become bearish because you're going to start moving into that exceptionally good price area called a guaranteed premium because the value, whilst it's bullish, it's not that bullish. Do you know what I mean? It's bullish, but it's not that bullish. Because the fair value is now static at this stage. It's not bearish. The fair value has never gone bearish, has it? Do you see the difference? Fair value has never gone bearish. You cannot look at me. You can't look at me. You can't look at that chart and tell me that that's bearish value. Because you've all said it's bullish value. When you didn't see the price, you all said it's bullish value, did you not? Before you saw the price, you all told me that that is bullish value. Well, just because you see price doesn't mean the value is going bearish, does it? Just because we see the price doesn't mean the value is going bearish. Do you understand? The price is moving into an overbought condition against that value, right? It's starting to move into an overbought position. But an overbought position doesn't mean a bearish position. It means the buyers have paid perhaps a little bit too much for that position, right? Overbought is not the same as bearish. It's like an overbought condition in a stochastic. Is that really bearish? Is an overbought stochastic bearish? No, it just tells you it is overbought. And it does tell you that it's overbought. That's where stochastic traders get it all wrong. That's where stochastics are great. If you just properly understood what the hell they're showing you, overbought is not the same thing. It is not the same as bearish. But if I now start changing this, if I start changing this, and I now draw something that looks maybe a little bit like this, would you now say the value is bearish? pretty obvious now, isn't it? The value has gone bearish and we're in an overbought condition. And we are in an overbought condition. Is that now a massive change to the narrative at the top edge? So now we've got an overbought condition, which is which could be bearish. It's certainly going to be profit taking, right? But now we've moved into an overbought plus. short value. Now I've got a brilliant sell. Now I have a brilliant sell. Now I'm the, you know, if I'm going to wait for those banker, buy, banker bets, those guaranteed opportunities, those all-in maximum type trades, we're all always aware that this might never happen. You, know, you might trade a whole, watch a whole day and have no trades. But when you start seeing that sell coming in here, and you are now definitely in an overbought condition, as well as as well as bullish, as well as bearish value, are you now annihilating the short sell in oil? Does everybody see the value in this, the difference in that trade right there? You may say, well, what about the previous trade? Okay, but the previous trade as well. If you must, I'll put in another arrow just to keep you happy. As you know, it's not one trade. We don't trade just once. We trade all of these. So this is the one you want to annihilate, Theo. Do you get it? Paul gets it. Everett gets it. Miguel gets it. So these are the ones we want to annihilate. We've got overbought conditions and we've got bearish value. Not just neutral value, because this was just neutral value, right? Neutral value. So when you look at what I was selling into, it was a bit of a mistake, wasn't it? I was selling into neutral value, but I was still selling at top of the bracket into neutral value. I was still selling top of the bracket into neutral value. 
So we just have to wait. And then the big cell comes in and popper is all the way through to the bottom edges. 85.80 to 84.80, guys, $1,000 paid into my bank account. $1,000. Is this bullish value when I bought it at the bottom edge here? Was that bullish value when I bought it at the bottom edge? Take the chart off the charts and see if it's bullish value. Is the answer no? When I bought it here on the first attempt, was it bullish value? Take the price off the charts and look at that purple line there. And at that stage there, you tell me whether that's bullish value or bearish value. No price action, guys. No price action. It's bearish neutral, right? Bearish neutral. Would you agree that we could call it bearish neutral? Would everybody be happy with that definition? Well, if it's bearish neutral, are you, are you really wanting to start buying it aggressively? Do you honestly want to start buying it aggressively? No, it's going to be a poor trade, isn't it? When does it become a possible great trade? Well, it becomes a possible great trade, would you agree, in terms of the just the purple line, when this takes out that line right there, when we've got a higher low, and a higher high, just like any other normal chart narrative, right? A higher high and a higher low suggests to me that the value is now trending higher, right? The value is now trending higher, so fair value is now trending higher. Would you all agree with me that at this stage, at this stage here, we now have an ability to really, really go to town on the bottom edge if we can get it? If we can get it. Now, at that stage, of course, you can see what happened. The value went against us, but we don't know that at the time. So when we got into that trade, am I now able to really work into this bottom edge trade here? Various neutral. I need at least for it to be turning up. At least for it to be turning up. Now, when we see what happened in here, can everybody now agree that this is a very, very, very outstanding trade there on the short sale? Can everybody agree that that's now no longer bearish neutral? That is bearish into a commercial level. Bearish into a commercial level for a sell, guys? Yes or no? So there's a perfect example of a perfect sell trade. Bearish. Into a commercial sell level. Benchmark, right? Benchmark. And into the low price, neutral. Bearish, neutral, into the low price. Are we starting to get into guaranteed discount prices? No. So what am I going to do at the low price? I'm going to book my profits, and I'm going to stand on the sidelines. Am I caring that I didn't buy the bottom edge? No. I never had a bullish market to buy into a bottom edge. I didn't have a bullish market to buy into a bottom edge. So am I bothered I didn't buy into a bottom edge? No. If I had the chance to buy into the bottom edge again, would I have bought the bottom edge? No. Could you argue that there was any type of guaranteed discount on this? Yes, absolutely. Let's do the guaranteed discount. So based on this, this is obviously a big RGL in the background. You're already aware of that. But let's just deal with the short term. We had the low price here. We had a high price here on the swing that created an N shape. Based on this N shape, we had a guaranteed discount price at this level here, yes? You all knew that guaranteed discount price was right there. So it is a guaranteed discount price. So when it trades into a guaranteed discount price, what must have happened? The value line against the previous arrow, which is here, cannot be any lower than the value line was at this point. Yes, that's the reason that's the reason that's a guaranteed discount price, correct?
a measured move is just a measured move. It doesn't make it a guaranteed discount price. Does everybody know the difference? Guaranteed discounts are to do with value. Measured moves are to do with structures. So this at this stage, at this stage here, we can't say that that's a guaranteed discount price. What we can see here is it's a measured move. Yeah, it's a measured move, but is it? A guaranteed discount price. Well, looking at structure, we can't tell. We can't tell. So we've got to look at structure. So we look at the dollar again and we ask the question, what was it doing when we traded into this area? Now let's take a look at the dollar at that stage. The dollar was there. The dollar previously was there. Over here, however, the dollar was somewhere in this area here. Is that a guaranteed discount price? It's feels like a guaranteed discount price, doesn't it? It's starting to feel like one. We can't confirm with 100% certainty that it is though, can we? We think it is because it looks as if, based on the fact that the lowest low we had in the dollar was over here, the lowest low we had in the dollar was over here, which puts the oil price away up here, but that's not realistic. The oil price was way too overpriced at that stage. That's why we got the big sell off in the first place. So I'm not measuring it against that price. There's got to be a better level to measure it against. And this is obviously the level that we want to measure it against here. So whilst it feels like it's got some discount, guaranteed discount in it, it's not a guaranteed discount price. It's got some discount in it. Now, if I could improve on that on the retest, this would be a brilliant trade because the discount is there for sure. This would be a brilliant trade. It does improve a little bit though, doesn't it? It does improve a little bit here. Not by much, but it does improve a little bit. And it might have just have been enough to buy into the lows. It might have been enough to buy the lows. If you don't, you don't, right? You just sit back and wait for the next trade, guys. There's no issues. There's no issues. You don't get upset that you missed the move higher. You don't get annoyed. You don't chase it. You just sit back and say, right, I'll go and make a cup of tea then and I'll come back in five or ten minutes and pick up the next trade because there's another one coming along soon guys guaranteed there's another one coming along pretty soon isn't trading wonderful how did my uh, sell on gold do by the way the my uh, shout out for gold shorts we did a shout out for a gold short trade anybody see how it did How did my shout out for gold shorts do, guys? We've just went from 76 to 66. Oh, yes. Another thousand dollar winner, guys. Another thousand dollar winner. Thank you very much. Is that not sweet? Is that not sweet? What the hell, right? Take a look at the value, guys. Look at that value. Sell side. Sell side, sell side only. Fair value, dropping off the highs. Dropping off the highs. Fair value, making lower lows. Fair value, moving the needle. Giving me an unfair high price to sell into. Giving me an unfair high to sell into. And that's us. We're ready to rock and roll, guys. We are ready. We had this capper price in place in the background here. Yeah, capper price, we had a target price because of that down into this price here. And that target price is what we've just reached. The value is still dropping, by the way. That's why you were just passive on your target prices. Value is passive. So obviously you can see that where we got from and to. So the capper price was beautiful. There it was there. Buy side, sell side, buy side, 50 line pullback, sell side. 50 line pullback because that was the original capper price here yes we drew this in at the time uh, cap buyer right there and then of course this became your cap buyer from that change and remember every time you put in a cap buyer trade you've got a measured move every time you put in a cap buyer trade you get a measured move out of it so 
When I've got a cap buyer trade here, Merv, 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 Marv. When I've got a cap buyer trade here, that gives me a measured move to here, doesn't it? So that's where my target price is. But the bearishness tells me that that's very, very good target price. Tells me that I'm probably going to do better than that. There's this. There's the opportunity to book some profits. And then you're selling on the halfback. Why? Because a cap buyer becomes what? Cap buyer becomes seller spending. Any cap buyer becomes a seller spending, right? Cap buyers always become seller spending. And you mark it on your chart. So that cap buyer break there becomes a seller spending area there. So we start marking off the seller spending. And we reevaluate that as a new question. Reevaluate it as a new question. So when we come into seller spending, we see the slowdown in price. Yes, we see the slowdown in price. We had the big volume on the lowest candles here, which is good news. So we see a slowdown in price. We want to sell into that. Massive volume at the bottom edges here. Massive volume at the bottom edges. We want to sell into that very low volume tester back up into the top edges here, right? And now we're looking at a measured move to the downside. We're looking easily at a measured move. We obviously have the idea that this is a bracket in its own right. This is a bracket in its own right. So that means that this must be a target price, yes? And that's exactly where the price targeted. It's exactly where the price got to right there, didn't it? Bounced. Now, I don't like this sell. I don't like these sells here for the re adding for very obvious reasons. The value isn't any lower than it was before. So this looks to me as if it's fair value. So at that stage, I would only be selling this top line up here again. It's the only place I would be selling because I would not have moved my fair value lower. If I haven't moved my fair value lower, I'm not going to be selling a halfback, would I? I would still sell the top edges. So whilst it would have been easy for me to say, oh, because of the, because of the uh, big... Uh, imbalanced seller spending, I easily sold all that business there. It's simply not the case. Having said that, having said that, the silver auction was actually doing very, very good as opposed to the copper gold auction. You can see the silver auction was very bearish. Look, the silver auction was very bearish from that phase, suggesting that we should have been uh, quite easily and quite conceivably running that type of auction, which should have moved the fair value down allowing you to sell into that, but that means that you're using a second line and a third line and a fourth line. Well, the thing is, Marv, you know, I mean, obviously, uh, you're, you're new into the room. And because of that, you don't, it's not always going to happen as it happens on the right hand edge. But the fact is, if you see it, whether you see it in hindsight or not, you've got to see it in hindsight before you can start seeing it on the right hand edge, haven't you? You've got to be able to start seeing them in hindsight. And you've got to be exposed to as many of these examples as you possibly can. And because you're getting exposed to these as, as examples, you're starting to then say on the right hand side, right, I've now had seen so many examples of this happening. I can now take advantage on the right hand side and see what I need to be seeing. And obviously what's happening here is that you're starting to recognize the very obvious, the very simple, basic ideas. Every time you finish an N or a, or, a, or a V shape, you should be drawing a measure, right? So where's the measure right now on oil? Now, the measure right now on oil, it doesn't matter about what value is doing. If you draw a level one, if you draw a level one, and you draw another level one, and you've got these two level ones here, you've also got a N shape and a V shape, right? So when you've got an N shape, you draw a measure to the downside. When you've got a V shape, you draw a measure to the upside. So if I've got a V shape that's just completed there, I draw a measure to the upside. And that's all I do. I now put an, an offer in at this price. I put an offer in at that price. Correct? That's what you do. You put... Correct? That's what you do. You put an offer in at that price because that's what the structure is. And that's what you've got to start thinking about, about these measured moves. I am putting an offer in at that price. So that's where my offer is at the moment, is in this area here. So we start putting in actual physical offers at that price. Why? Because if I get into a long trade, that's where I'm going to be selling it. Make sense?
So when you do that, magical things happen. Magical things happen. What do you mean? Well, if I drew this in here, for example, and I'd seen this N shape complete, as soon as I see that N shape complete there, I would then put in a bid at this price here. I'd put a bid into the market at this price here. Well, what happened when that price traded? What actually physically happened when that price traded? You see buyers came in at that price. Well, that's because there's bids there. That's because there's actual physical bids at that price. That's why. So when I see the level two starting to structure here, and I'm starting to think to myself, okay, there's a big pin on this, but you get the basic idea that when that level two starts to pin there and I draw that in, you start saying, well, there's going to be bids here. There's going to be bids here. Well, what happened when the price traded here? A big surge of volume again. For buyers, surprisingly enough, because that's where the bids are. And there might not be bids in terms of, if I am bearish, the bid is a profit take, right? So if I'm bearish 100 contracts, the bid might be for 20 of them. And if the value is getting really, really bad as the price drops, as in, as in becoming very, very bullish, I wouldn't just be bidding 20. I would add another 50 to that 20 and maybe add another 80 to the 20 and I'd take the full position out. So I'd go from a 20 position there to a 100 position there. So you can start to recognize this as a storyline in terms of the way the volume builds, the way that the trade builds, and the way that these little individual targets build around them as well. And remember, guys, you're not going to catch everything that moves. You let it go. You let it go. You just let it go. I mean, how was that target price, for example, on my NASDAQ? We targeted 830, guys. It bounced off 830, and it went straight back to what price? seller's pending price right it went straight back to the seller's pending price did it not did it not but that comes back to the narrative of building your narrative properly let me show you the triggers let me show you the triggers and let me show you the <coughs> excuse me. So, if you remember, we did the uh, full max sell trade, yes? So, there was a full max sell trade right there. Based on the full max sell trade, there was our top edge price, yes? 76s, bottom edge cap buyers. Everybody agree with that? And then we move to the measure. Max comes in and takes all the profits off the table. So you get the big aggregation into the bottom edges for the profit take. It comes back up to the pending sellers area. Max doesn't sell it for whatever reason. Max not really keen on the sell. Um, Max doesn't sell it. I, I did actually cut Max off a little bit short of the last uh, trade. So I'll apologize to Max later uh, because I did do him out of a I did do them out of a little bit of an interesting outcome. So I'll bring it back across for you to see it. Okay, so there was a sell. There's the all in max sell right there. There's a profit take there. We get another possible profit take there if you had decided on your own to sell this area here, which was the pending sellers level. We got down into the prior swing here. Max took profits and then Max bought it here. You see that's within two candles of the previous uh, level. Remember I said if it's in two candles, <coughs> you can add them together. So that became an all-in Max light buy trade right there. 
that became an all-in max buy trade right there. So that became a buy trade at a price of 8.28s. And Max just traded 8.68s for 40 points, guys. 40 points. On the way up, 40 points. Max actually has just sold um, the top edge there, guys, at 68s. Max went short 68s. Not on an all-in maximum, by the way, but into a into the top edges. Max sold into the 68 print on the uh, reversal. There's the max uh, trade as it happened there on Max Light. Uh, so you can see there's the max buy trade there. There it is there, yeah. So there's the max buy trade there. That is a max buy trade. And that's a max light sell trade just there, top edge. Remember, you're not selling on the way up, guys. If it's only on its own, you're not selling on the way up. You want to be very, very passive. And uh, max light came in. Sell side before the cash open. Sell side, sell side only. Starting to flash up a possible buy trade here, but it's a max light buy trade. So that's not a buy until it stops. That's not a buy trade until it stops and reverses, guys. Okay. So unless we get an ag on that sell trade, that's a 68 sell has just traded 20, guys. A 68 sell has just traded 20. 48 points. That's nearly a thousand dollars. That is nearly a thousand bucks, guys, on that sell trade there. And that started two minutes ago. Thousand dollars, guys. Two minutes ago. And now we've got a max buy coming in. Now remember, the max buy is only a reversal trade. It's not a buy yet. And what we talked about buying on a reversal trade is waiting for the price to turn around and give you the uh, the kind of half back trade buy entry price. So we're just into the cash open. You're always going to get more volatility, not less. You give it a little bit of space to breathe. So this is still not a buy trade yet, guys. This is still not a buy trade for me. So we're bringing in that buy stop order. So we've sold at 68s. We're now trading at 12s. That's a very good profit. That's a that's a, over a thousand dollars. We over a thousand dollars now on that buy trade. And we're just letting it go just now. We're just letting it go just now, guys. There she goes. Perfect. Letting it go. Letting it go. Letting it go. And breathe. Let it go, guys. Just let it go. And wait for it to reverse out. And when it reverses out, there's going to be a nice buy opportunity. There it's reversed out of that candle. Do you see it? So your buy trade would have been bringing down into the candle as it went lower. And there's your reverse buy trade right there. See it? There it is. There's your reverse buy trade. So you'd have probably have bought around about the 12, 13 price just there. Probably about the 12 or 13 price. And you can see that 12 or 13 has now just gone up to a high price there of 37s. So you've just seen a max buy trade, max all in buy trade coming into play there at around about the 13 print. It's now just traded about 40. And you've just made another 27 points. It's another $540 in 30 seconds. Not bad. Pretty rubbish. Pretty average. I think it's okay. Considering it's the very light version of everything. Very light version of everything at the moment. Remember, when I...